Welcome back. Our next session is a panel discussion exploring Indigenous Australian sovereignties. The panel discussion will be chaired by Associate Professor Sandra Phillips. A member of the Waka Waka and Garang Garang Nations in Queensland, Sandra is Associate Dean Indigenous Engagement at the University of Queensland and also a member of the Library Board of Queensland. Sandra will uh, chair the session and she'll be joined by Rose Barracliffe, who is a Butchelot doctoral student at the University of Sunshine Coast in Queensland. And Rose's research is grounded in the Kagari Research Archive, an archive that is about the Butchelot traditional country, also known as Fraser Island. Kirsten Thorpe of the Wurrumay Nation, a senior researcher at Jabana Institute for Indigenous Education and Research at the University of Technology, Sydney. And Kirsten is a doctoral candidate at Monash University, where she's investigating the question of Indigenous cultural safety in Australian libraries and archives. And our third panel member is Nathan Muddy Sentens, a Wurundjeri librarian and museum educator who grew up in Dakajan country. And Nathan currently works at the Australian Museum as digital program manager and writes about critical librarianship and critical museology from a First Nations perspective. The full bio details of all of our speakers are of course available on the platform. So welcome Sandra and I'll let you take over the discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much Vicky. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening wherever you are today. I'm joining the um, conference on the lands of the Yugara and Turrbal peoples in the city of Mianjin, also known as Brisbane, the capital of Queensland in Australia. I acknowledge all of the countries, the First Nations countries um, of the fellow panellists or the panellists this morning, and also pay respect to our elders and custodians uh, locally, nationally and globally. Thanks very much for your introduction, Vicky. Straight into the panel. The recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's sovereignties is yet to be fully considered by the Australian library sector. While attempts have been made to incorporate Indigenous perspectives into areas such as exhibitions, programming and collection development and documentation, they still fall short in terms of being deeply embedded by Indigenous worldviews and ways of knowing. That of course is from the panel description. Why is that important? I quote Aileen Morton Robinson, the collective rights of sovereignty are perceived by Indigenous women, she writes in 2000 and in her revised edition, the 21st, uh, 20th anniversary edition of Talking Up to the White Woman, Indigenous Women and Feminism. She writes, I repeat, the collective rights of sovereignty are perceived by Indigenous women as being synonymous with the rights of self-determination which in response to the effects of colonization and decolonization, particularly since the 1970s, has become locally and globally the objective of Indigenous peoples. In writing about sovereignty and self-determination as synonymous concepts, Morton Robinson quotes Marcia Langton, who identified in 1988, 13 goals of Indigenous Australian self-determination. Let me briefly share with you some of those goals. Once again, um, Marcia Langton in 1988 made a sovereignty and self-determination synonymous concepts while she was working on the development of the United Nations of the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So um, some of the other goals that um, Professor Langton referred to back then um, and perhaps still now uh, land rights legislated at the federal level, the right to control our access to our lands, the right to control our, um, all access, our access, all access to rivers and waterways on or adjacent to Aboriginal land, the right to all minerals and resources on Aboriginal land, the right to marine resources of the sea, and seabed up to a limit of 10 kilometres where the sea is adjacent to Aboriginal land. I'm not identifying all 13 goals that Professor Langton referred to, um, just some of them, but you're beginning to get a sense of the, the comprehensive nature of the rights of control conceptualised under sovereignty and self-determination. So, on that note, 
I will now move to each of the panelists. Thank you, Vicky, for your introduction of each. We are working today in alphabetical order by family name. Um, my virtual background is my country, um, the Waka Waka, um, First Nation country. Um, and I can see that Rose and Kirsten also have backgrounds on that they may want to refer to. Firstly, we will go through um, very um, brief overviews from each of the panelists on the nature of their provocations, just to remind people where, um, what had been shared previous to today, starting with Rose. Thank you, Sandra. Gullangul Jali, everyone. Um, I am coming to you today from the lands of the Kabi Kabi Gabi Gabi peoples, and I would like to pay my respect to their community and their elders and just recognise that their sovereignty um, was never ceded along with the sovereignty of all other First Nations in what we now call Australia. As mentioned, I am Butchula. In my background is the east coast of Gari or Fraser Island at sunrise. Um, and I'd just like to pay my respects to my elders and ancestors who are with me today. Um, thank you everyone who listened to the provocations. What I was trying to uh, demonstrate in my provocation is that as a First Nations person who accesses libraries and, and archives records within libraries, the way that I see a record can often be different to the way that a non-Indigenous person would see a record. Um, and the, the photo that I shared is a key example of that, that collection of photos um, held a number of community members from, from my community from a very special event in which our elders hosted heads of state from other parts of the world. And yet, our elders who we consider to be our heads of state were not recognised in the information, the metadata of that record. Um, and I think that is one, one simple example of where we can have some, some quick wins, I guess, um, in recognising sovereignty in libraries and archives. Um, and something that, that librarians, that you as librarians, have, have very real control over the access to information that, that all people see, but particularly that, that preferences or presupposes the sovereignty of Indigenous peoples. You have the right or you have the power to control metadata um, and to presuppose sovereignty in any material that you have within your collections. Um, and I think, you know, I, I gave the example or the comparison between how, uh, how visible records are for other tiny nations that would compare in land size or in populations to First Nations. Um, and what we can see when we do that, when we use the same process or the same metrics that we would use for a nation that, that is considered to be a sovereign nation without question, is that there's much more presence of those nations in records. You can see a lot more information when you use the online catalogues. Um, so what I guess my thing is that I would like everyone to consider that when you think about the information that you have in your collections and also how you, you provide access to that record through your online catalogues. Thanks, Sandra. Thanks so much, Rose. Um, and we're moving next to Nathan for a brief overview of his provocation. So, you're tomorrow, Lindugi, Nathan sends you a naughty, where I just give it by the way. Into my job, Gadigal, Mudikango, into my job, Gadigal, Norm Bungle. So, um, yeah, I'm Nathan Sands. So, as I said in my introduction, I'm a Wiradjuri man, traditionally from um, Mudgee, New South Wales, uh, sort of Western New South Wales, but I'm um, Coming to you from Gadigal country, and I'd also like to pay my respects to um, the traditional owners of the Gadigal people and acknowledge, uh, like Rose said, that sovereignty was never ceded. And no matter where we, what we do on this country or, or all the lands of, that we now call Australia, no matter what's built on them, that they always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, so um, my provocation, and I suggest um, after I talk, if you haven't listened to them, give our provocations a listen up, Rose and Kirsten's provocation. 
uh, awesome. Um, but uh, my provocation was really about uh, really thinking about can libraries um, support Indigenous sovereignty? It's kind of a question of um, libraries, archives, and museums. Considering a couple of things, as workers, can we engage beyond neutrality? Because um, when I was starting to become a librarian and early in my career, being objective, being neutral was um, heralded as the goal of librarianship. And I think to actually um, our lives as Indigenous people, um, our sovereignty is political. Um, so to actually support it would mean libraries, archives and museums engaging in political work. And in my provocation, I sort of mentioned how in some cases being neutral is very complicit to or assists the status quo, which has been built upon the denial of Indigenous sovereignty. And that the complicity and neutrality is actually an access issue it actually can create barriers towards access to information. And the example I use is Indigenous sacred sites. We are not um, advocating for their protection as organisations, which is can be a political you know, position to take. Um, the, the access to that information is, may be lost forever. So they are access issues to be um, neutral. Um, to, and it's, it's a political decision not to be neutral to. And my other one was to sort of, um, in the theme of this um, conference is control. I believe that um, a lot of our, especially organizations I, pre I worked for and previously worked for the Australian Museum and the State Library of New South Wales are both state government organizations. They drive their power and any sort of resources they gain from a state that was built on the denial of indigenous sovereignty. So, I think one of the, the only way we can start to support sovereignty as well as organizations is to, um, in many cases in public organizations, is to relinquish the control or um, have the power that we derive um, come from um, Indigenous so. Thanks, Nathan, that's fantastic. And we'll return to fuller discussion, of course, with Rose, Nathan and Kirsten after Kirsten does a brief overview of her provocation as well. And please send through questions um, and we'll feed that to the panel as well throughout. Thanks, Sandra, and th thanks, Nathan and Rose, and thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, I'm coming to you today from the land of the Gringai people close to Dakinjung country. Um, and on screen behind me is the picture at Port Stephens. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge um, my family on my mum's side are um, more of my um, from that area. So I guess with my provocation, I wanted to start with uh, some contemplation on the idea that we're all living on stolen land and, and really position that as a question that um, I'd really like people to sit with and think about what does it mean for you to exist and live on stolen land, but what does it mean for your library to operate on stolen land? I think in, um, in line with Rose and Nathan as well with their provocations, um, really going back to that idea um, that Australia was founded on the, the falsehood that, is, that we were terra nullius. So in so many ways, the ways that our libraries operate presently is working on that paradigm that we were terra nullius. So, um, what I see so much in my work and, you know, whether it's across the spectrum of libraries is often um, Indigenous collection services are either an afterthought or they're a, a sort of something that's added on rather than being embedded in the way that we operate. So I also argued um, in my provocation that libraries can do a lot, but they're still very much seen as places as, of trauma and distrust to communities. And I know that uh, in the, the last keynote, there was a discussion around going out and doing outreach, which I think is fantastic and bringing people back in. But my question really is around where are we bringing people back into? So who controls the resources? Um, who's making decisions? What are these spaces that we see um, in libraries? So I also spoke about um, leadership and called out and recognised to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are watching today what I would describe and in my PhD research as warrior archivists and librarians and glam workers who are really forging the way and bringing these conversations. 
but also recognizing that that people are really overwhelmed um where we're sort of at this place of tension where people are trying to forge priorities for communities um but we're surrounded in an information landscape that is based on a history of colonization, dispossession. So we're tackling many complex issues at the one time. And I also turn to um, an example of practice looking at how, you know, a lot of our major collecting institutions work on the focus of extracting information from communities. So our sort of collecting focus, um, if you like, and looking at, you know, publications coming in is always about people wanting something from communities and, and taking it from places. And I guess I wanted to think about that reimagining space. Um, you know, if we were to to look at sovereignty as being the foundation, and thinking about what I sort of work towards is that idea of living libraries and living archives on country. And I guess my questions that I ended with was, you know, how could librarians and glam workers really start to support a reallocation of funding and resources and focus that truly supported those. Um, those pillars of self-determination, Sandra, that you introduced so that community were driving um, the things that they needed instead of it being about extraction. Um, and also those other super, superficial things like the exhibitions are all wonderful to tell stories, but I would question whether they're really things that communities want. I think if we actually went out and did the proper work, we would have a different information landscape to the one that we currently have. Thanks so much for those um, great overviews of really thought-provoking contributions that you've already circulated to the participants of this conference. Um, now, Rose, you speak about metadata and you chose a fairly clear example um, where I would suggest there was a breakdown in application of uh, a commitment to the way in which Indigenous um, people should be represented in um, uh, through a library. Is it right that the, the Aboriginal woman who went unnamed in the first instance, um, is it correct that she is Bachelor Elder Gail Minicon? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so firstly, can we honour her and her status as a sovereign Bachelor woman first? Yeah. And um, I'd like to hear more from you about her status. And, and given that she was um, speaking on her country with the um, Premier of Queensland, Anastasia Palaszczuk, and Prince Harry, the Duke of Duck Sussex, um, you write extensively about um, what it means to recognise all of those um, sovereign, the sovereignty inherent in each of those roles. Can you speak a bit more to the sovereignty inherent in Bachelor Elder Gail Minicon as she stands there on Bachelor Country? Sure. Um, I think it's important to recognise that um, when an elder or a community member gets forward and represents the community, they're doing that because there's a long history that comes prior to that point in time. And in the instance of that photo, it was that the Butchler Nation had been through a long, long native title process, which had resulted in, um, in being granted native title and then from that forming a representative body. Um, so all of that process is recognising that we had an undying connection or an unsettled connection to the land and our culture and we continue to practise it. In other words, our sovereignty was never ceded. Um, and then as part of this representative body called the prescribed body corporate, um, we have a democratic process where we elect a board that represents us to government, to other governments, um, to the community, to businesses. So Auntie Gail, at the time of that photo, was the chairperson of that board. Um, and therefore what we would have seen as our, one of our senior representatives, our head of state effectively, um, at that time. Also, just to acknowledge that the reason Prince Harry was on the island was because of a long negotiation about the Queen's canopy, which um, Gurry was chosen as one of the two sites for that in Australia. 
And the negotiation for that being part of the Queen's Canopy Program was a joint negotiation between the Butchler PBC, um, the Queensland Government and the Palace effectively or the, the program management for that. Um, so it really was the coming together of heads of state and that photo represents all of that. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. We do have some questions coming in as well, but I'll first go back to Nathan's point. One of your central concepts is around neutrality, which makes me think it's not enough to not be racist. Um, one has to be anti-racist. That's kind of an, an analogous to this idea that if you're neutral, um, you're actually part of the problem because um, the structure of institutions were born out of a coloniality so to actually reverse coloniality, you have to take a position that is not neutral. Can you um, give us some examples, Nathan, or, or anything you want to um, expand further on that concept? Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, yeah, like the example I used in my provocation was back when I did used to work at the State Library in New South Wales, and I used to, um, me, Kirsten, and members of that team, we used to go to different public libraries. and. Uh, and I know public libraries have gotten better since then, but at that time I used to always go to the Aboriginal history and culture section, see what books they had. And so many times the um, latest book they had was the Fabrication of Aboriginal History by Keith Winchard, like horribly racist um, material. It's, you know, a, a, along many things it sort of denies and and says the history and effects of the stolen generations are exaggerated. It's a horribly racist text. And, you know, um, seeing that would make me, you know, angry. And I, I, and I, I always think, like, I should just get, um, especially the public library, should just, you know, not have that material on the shelves. And I remember having a conversation with some other librarians about it, and they were saying, well, we can't. Like, like that's, that would be censorship. That would be, like, we're objective. We can't censor material just because we don't like it. And I was thinking, like, no, there's obvious power dynamics in play and censorship has already taken form. Like, the fact that the earliest book you have on um, the latest book, I mean, the most recent book on this, and of other materials created by um, Aboriginal people on different topics, and the fact that, you know, um, most public library shelves are, uh, you know, the Australian history section is quite small, and they chose to to um, give some of that space to the rest of the material is giving it power and legitimacy. That's not a neutral position, it's not an objective position. That is legit um, taking it, that's really taking a stance. And it has, um, and also we've got to think about, uh, like one of the things I always say to is, um, one of my criticisms, and like to be honest, I love libraries, that's the reason why I've been involved in them. Um, but inside the libraries, we do have a tendency to believe our and then we do, we do a lot of but our very existence is good. And I always say that I actually have to do good to be good. Not um, just good because they exist. And in that scenario, just existing or just it's actually, it is a stance and it's an asset issue because it tells, it could potentially tell First Nations people who came out of our space that we are not welcome by saying that, that, that you were giving, giving that particular way out. out. Um, and and similarly, another one I was just thinking about was the preservation um, uh, of Aboriginal sites. sites because as I, 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 I said, said start, start, we often didn't get our power from um, state, local, federal governments, as well as like libraries, archives, and museums. That's where we get our funding, our resources. So it is really hard to be political, but in some cases, um, our sacred sites contain so much information. If our mission is to preserve and provide access to the information, then the preservation of those sacred sites is, is of the utmost importance. Um, you know, some of these sacred sites have tens of thousands of years of information and are integral to preserving First Nations culture. And their destruction also, I believe, undermines our sovereignty in some cases. So if you wanted to support it, you have to advocate for their protection. And I think that's something that we as do because again, it's not a neutral stance, but if being neutral means doing nothing, then those sites will make, if you are assisting those sites potentially being destroyed, which is also not a neutral position. I think um, it's, uh, I think a lot of people talk in sort of, you know, in the space of 
like the, the uh, another research to the Bible that you know that silence is violence. I, I truly believe that in action is violence and neutrality. Um, yeah, as you said, a sister status quo that was built upon um, dispossession. It's a, it's a status quo that we need to sort of fundamentally change to make a more sort of um, equal and just society. Mm, beautiful. Thank you, Nathan. Um, which makes me think very strongly of, of what you focus on, Kirsten, around living archives and living libraries on country. So this, this session is really um, about provoking uh, deeper imaginings around what is possible. So we've got a few questions coming through. I will ask them verbatim, just so that you guys can each interpret them and answer them in turn or however you want to do it. Um, but before we go to those questions, which are um, very much a please tell us how to do this or please tell us some concrete examples of this, which is kind of a, a different um, level of uh, intellectual labour. What we're doing firstly is um, helping to unpack some of the existing concepts and reconstitute some new concepts that may actually get people thinking differently before we go to a how-to. So Kirsten, I'm going to, uh, that's a big build up to you to, to tell us more about living archives and living libraries on country. So I think, Sandra, your point of people wanting to do good is kind of fundamental. It's a, an underlying principle, I think, of the you know, certainly the Australian library profession and archives, people, you know, go to work and they want to make, they want to help people. They're looking for ways to, you know, pursue, you know, whether it's programming or um, collecting right or doing the outreach. But, you know, my argument is that are they the right things that we're doing? Um, and if we flip that model around and we actually think about, um, I guess, not only having you know, Aboriginal libraries and archives living on country, but people being able to connect with them in a local area, how amazing that might be. And I sort of go back to, you know, when we were writing our provocations, um, I think that Nathan, Rose and I were all sharing them and on Invasion Day. And I've just moved to a new area and I was thinking, wouldn't it be incredible for the local community to have a resource in whatever way it, it wanted to be um, imagined or, or articulated locally, but wouldn't it be fantastic to know the history of an area and how that continues through to now? And it might be different to the way that people think about and operate um, in a building or in a structure um, that's about circulation of books or those programs. So I think for me, that idea of where do we start is it's, really exciting for people but I really want to question what is that starting point and who leads that discussion about where we start and in my experience what happens with um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people working in this space is we're often kind of being pulled down this path um, of action that it isn't self-determined so we're we're sort of trying to bring that back to a self-determined position but fundamentally we aren't Seeing the leadership or we're not negotiating agreements locally with communities in the way that we need to do it and one of the things that I talked about in my provocation is that idea of um, people in the sector really leading this change and it puts people in a very vulnerable position that you know a library will say we want to do something where should we start but those conversations should actually be um, formulated through agreements with local communities and Rose has talked about examples of governance structures they exist you know we need to go back to um, actually getting out the door and also not designing things because you think it's a good idea um, you know the, you could say let's do story time in local language but is that a burden to community um, is it something that people want you know let's do an exhibition on a particular topic um, you know, go out and ask people what they want and you might actually end up in a much more um, incredible situation. But I think fundamental to the topic of the conference and the panel is it's actually about letting go of control. Um, and what I, I see so much is people having those good ideas but not being able to um, pass those resources on, reallocate their power and their control um, for community causes. And that's what is really exciting to me about the idea of 
contemplating and imagining the idea that you're living on stolen land because it puts you in another framework to even start to ask those questions of where do I start? And I know that's challenging to go really big, but I think um, that's part of our, we, we start to take action in a way that doesn't consider those questions of terra nullius and, and stolen land. Fantastic, thank you, Kirsten. I'll, I'll throw some of the questions to the panel now as well. So um, one of the conference participants was interested in the question of digitization of indigenous stories um, and wanting to know about some initiatives that you're familiar with and whether patrons, library patrons are able to access such digitized stories as obviously eBooks or audio books. Are, any, are there any striking examples that either of you want to share with the um, conference? Um, I'm currently involved in a digitization project. Um, that's what my role is as digital programs manager at the Australian Museum. It'll be looking at digitizing uh, cultural um, heritage objects of the collection. But again, it, it's going to take a very long time. And as Kirsten was saying, it's, and even now, I, I do believe we can do good with it, but it is a backwards sort of thing where. Um, it wasn't like we got a lot of community saying, can you digitize materials? And then we, we started to start this project. We really have started this project and now I'm looking to ask community what they want from it. Um, and because like, like, do some communities even want their cultural objects existing in the digital world in, in, on servers that they, um, at the moment, do not control their state government servers? Do they want that uh, how do we share custodianship through digital system? Um, because again, we, just by the nature of um, how we exist, we do have a lot of, um, there is an unfair balance in the power dynamics as we have the cultural heritage of communities. Um, and we also have the means to hold servers, to things. And again, um, if we can relinquish on that power, I think this could be a thing for good, but it's also up to the community. Some communities might want them material digitized so they can have um, forego um, geographical barriers to access their cultural heritage. Some will just want the physical material returned to their communities, and we should respect that. Some communities may want us to continue to preserve the material, but um, not want digital um, derivatives of their material. And uh, I think, yeah, I think it is that sort of thing of self determination. Like um, something like ebooks is perfectly fine because those books are published with fear wide ways, but I do think about like uh, the dangers of creating um, information too accessible for things like um, indigenous cultural and intellectual property. Like it could have a damaging effect um, if uh, we digitize all these things and, you know, I don't know, like a country, uh, an artist in Sweden uses them to make design carpets as you've heard stories or things like that. So like, I think, um, I think yeah, we need to, um, and that's what I'm working on now is trying to embed how we can have self-determination, how we can work agreements and memorandums of understandings and shared stewardship agreements with communities that everything that we do on the project um, is based on their wishes. But I think it even, um, it does have an, it does have the issue, as I said at the start, where this would have been better if, if we were going out to communities beforehand and just asking them what they wanted. And digitization may have became one of the things they wanted, but really we started with this is the digitization project, and now we're looking at how that project can serve community. But it's still a backwards, probably not a self determining way, but I'm hoping through so um, engaging with community that we can make it a collaborative process. Thanks, Nathan. And Kirsten, did you have something you wanted to say on that? Yeah, I think one of the the dangers again is going to the idea of doing the stuff without working out what people want. Um, and it is important, you know, we all have to think of resources and planning and, and particular projects that need to be done. Um, but that idea of jumping to a place of um, even needing to curate or digitize material, I've had a lot of um, experience in working in with uh, language revitalization projects and what I often see is that, you know, you jump to the digital, you jump to the engagement, but you don't recognise that people are actually healing from trauma and trauma of loss of language, um, 
trauma of people um, not being able to speak language. So there's there's an output that happens with digitization and digital curation, but there's also a lot of other healing work that's going on in between. And to me, that's the stuff that libraries sometimes don't see. They're not aware that it's happening, but we actually need to build the resources around um, the social and emotional well-being of people when we engage. So I would really encourage people to not just think about the output, but also the processes that you're engaging with when you're planning this work. But of course, there's amazing things happening all over the country um, in terms of these projects, but it's having some really deeply embedded principles. And I think, you know, for the discussion today to be thinking about sovereignty and to be reading more about what sovereignty means before you start to design those projects so that you don't lose sight of what you're actually doing. Because we all talk about colonialism like it's in the past, but it is here in the present and our collecting paradigms are very much in the spirit of a continued colonization of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander knowledges and we need to be aware of that when we design projects. Once you see it you can't unsee it. Um, so Rose you want to say something? Yeah I just wanted to add that um, as Nathan and Kirsten have touched on we have to be really careful about pan-indigenizing when we're talking about any sort of decision, like we can't just say that in, uh, digitize, sorry, digitization is good or bad for Indigenous peoples. Um, if we're respecting sovereignty, then you have to respect the fact that we're talking about hundreds of nations. You know, you wouldn't broker a deal with Spain then expect France to automatically agree to it just because they're both in Europe, would you? So, you know, we, you shouldn't be doing the same thing here. Um, and also just the complexity around the while digitization might happen, then there's also complexity around access, even if it is digitized. Um, I myself am, am an Indigenous researcher, so I find it incredibly helpful to have some things digitized, but that's not to say they should be made available to everyone in the community. I think we all know that. Um, but I also just want to flag that Indigenous people aren't necessarily just interested in Indigenous records or Indigenous content. I'm interested in anything about my traditional country and that's not just cultural knowledge, that's everything that's happened on country since colonisation. So there's multiple layers in there that, again, if you are um, prefacing um, sovereignty and working with community first and understanding their wants and needs, I think you can work out the rest of those issues from there. Thanks, Rose. And while we've got you there, someone asked about in relation to metadata, what can cataloguers do? Is there a thesaurus of Aboriginal subject terms and headings cataloguers can use? What, what's your take on that? Mm. Well, again, back to the, your, let's think about it on a nation's, a First Nation level. So um, each First Nation will be at a different stage with that. Some will have um, a thesaurus or a dictionary of language that you could use or you could access with working with the community. Um, I'm currently within my research project um, trying to find bachelor words that are existing in old records and bringing them together and then trying to identify them in other records. So there's, there's work being done um, but yeah, some nations will be further along with that than others. You really just have to um, think about which community you want to work with and speak to them about what resources they have um, and if they're willing to allow that to be used in metadata. Fantastic, thank you. And whoever asked, how do we catalog Aboriginal material? Subject terms, question, headings, question. Library Congress headings are so skewed to Western terms, you can consider Rose's, Rose's response then to be answer to your question as well. Um, someone else has asked for an example of GLAM, uh, GLAM organisation or organisations working where sovereignty has been recognised in the work and then poses the question, is this possible? anyone want to take that? <laughs> um, I'm very much, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm focused in my little corner of the world, so possibly 
I'm not across everything that's happening, although I have seen some great examples in BC Canada where they, and you'll have to forgive me, I've forgotten the name of the institution that did it, but they re-catalogued their entire collection according to the First Nation. Um, and then for those who are familiar with the Tandanya Declaration that just came out from the international, uh, the ICA, um, the, um, was it South Australia, Kirsten, did a really good job of going to community and working with many organisations um, across South Australia to ask how they would like that to be implemented and then developed a framework from that. Is anyone Thanks, else? Hope. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. There's a BC example of... Um, adoption of all First Nation terms in that. That's that's fascinating. Kirsten, did you want to add to that? Yeah, again, I think there are many examples and it would be difficult even in a forum like this to call them out because, you know, I know even if we're thinking about, um, you know, the, the state-based work that um, people have different kind of contexts and different demands and I think people achieve amazing things um, based on their own circumstances. So the, the knowledge centers in Queensland, um, the work of the State Library in response to Cook, you know, the, um, the Australian Museum, there's a lot that's happening. Um, I mean, my thing is going back again to the, these questions, these bigger questions of who's leading that. And if people are looking for examples, there's an, a network of um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander workers out there. Terry Jenke's latest um, roadmap as well for, um, galleries and museums really sets the you know the agenda in terms of a decade or long plan so um, looking at examples is and modeling is one thing but we need to start to think you know in my view how we start to resource this work because nothing happens without someone making a decision to allocate funding to these projects and you know if you looked at um, Terry's roadmap it really um it, it brings the principles, but it also brings some of the, the complex work around, you know, looking at racism and representation um, and then looking ahead to, you know, how we really change the sector to address some of those issues, but refocus to be um, priorities built on Indigenous ways of knowing, being and doing. Um, I think that we, yeah, we need to allocate funds and ensure that we have a new workforce of Indigenous people across GLAM that are here in leadership positions. And I know that some institutions have done that, but we really need to um, have a sector that fully supports this work. Because I, I'm afraid even if we call out the good projects, I wonder um, at what cost did that come to the workers who did that? What, you know, how many years of work behind the scenes did people negotiate, build relationships with community? Um, so I know that doesn't answer the question, but I think there's just layers underneath there that we need to consider. Oh, I think it does answer the question. And this is the, the trick, the, the tough spot that Indigenous people are often put in, that we, we seek to reframe the question on our term before answering it. Uh, so we're, we're answering the question, proposing the real question we, we would prefer to be asked and hearing and then responding to. So we work in so many registers constantly, which goes to your point, Kirsten, about um, the cost of the labour that's gone into what could become a, a showcase examples. But the, you make an excellent corollary point, which is the showcase examples might not work on another um, piece of stolen land in relation to that First Nations community. So it's, it's the complexity here is on what I'm hoping that the panel is opening up for the participants, that there are no simple um, quick fixes here. Um, and negotiation and relationship building seems to be fundamental to all future work. Someone asks, um, and this is to all the panel, um, whether uh, government controlled collecting institutions are the place for this kind of work. Um, and is there a way in which uh, First Nations agency over our, their cultural collections, uh, is there a way that that can be better enabled beyond the rubrics of state control, I guess? 
Yeah, um, I think this is one of the things I, I've come against, like just in my like shortish career is like, um, I remember uh, several years ago, I read a piece uh, and in the, it called, uh, talked about how archives need archival decolonists. And I really liked it. And so I stole it and made it my blog name. And that's what I write under as the archival decolonist. And I was really engaging in sort of uh, decolonizing literature at the time. And then I, in like the last few years, I really think about how with this, with the Australian Museum, um, you know, it, it's, it is changing, but there's colonization in its bones and its foundations. It's how do you decolonize something that is innately colonized? Um, and I think uh, indigenous people around Australia, around the world are, are coming up against that. And I think there is a thing where, um, you know, we can um, have shared stewardship agreements or um, memorandums of understanding with individual communities around the cultural heritage that we hold, but there is a bad history on how that collection in some cases got to our collections. Uh, and there is, again, like unfair power dynamics and previously and places like, um, you know, something like the British Museum is like a tourist destination. So um, it basically has profited on stolen cultural heritage in some way. So there is a power that we need to change. I know that I, I've spoken to um, cultural worker Peter White previously, and he previously worked at the Australian Museum. And uh, unfortunately, it sounded like a really cool initiative, but unfortunately it didn't keep getting funded past the 90s. But in the early 90s, they basically long-term loaned a lot of the cultural heritage to cultural centers that were popping up all around New South Wales in the early 90s. So, and that's basically one way that um, we can promote sovereignty is basically having those objects back in country controlled by the community today. Um, but even then there's still like uh, um, some power dynamics in the sense that they're a long-term loan um, and we would state what, in lots of cases, what um, are the methods of preservation. But in a lot of those cases, we, from what I understand from what Peter told me is the museum was paying for all that. We were paying for the special cases and all the preservation. So it still probably is not a completely self-determining model, but it was at the same time, at least having those objects on country controlled by the commuters and the commuters could then use that to, um, you know, to uh, sort of um, complement the sovereignty in some ways. And I think that's probably the closest. Um, and yeah, I think the unfortunate thing is anything that comes from the museum is innately colonial. I just think by the nature of it, um, Kirsten mentioned our, um, our unsettled exhibition that's opening this year. I was meant to open last year, but I've been delayed because of COVID. But that was in response to the, the Cook 250th anniversary. And again, it wasn't um, really a self-determining model in the sense that the museum wanted this exhibition. And, but we tried to do the best we could to adapt it to meet community wishes by, we basically asked around 803 Aboriginal cultural and people from all across Australia and just basically asked them, what would you want to see in the exhibition? What don't you want to see in the exhibition? What do you think of the Australian Museum? And what do you think of James Cook? And from those sort of four questions, we sort of, um, that is what the how the exhibition is going to come to be is based on what we got in the results and um, to, like that was ours trying to to our best ability to uh, to fill people which is but it did come from a seed from idea that was not community inspired so community weren't coming up to us saying um, we want this truth telling exhibition about Cook but we are now turning it into a truth telling exhibition about Cook based on community wishes and community feedback. Thanks, Nathan. That's a, a comprehensive response. There's a, a shorter question here. Um, what is IATSIS's role in this, the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies? Does any panellists want to respond to that? Um, I, I think, Sandra, and thanks for the question. Um, IATSIS have an incredible role. Um, you know, it was founded on a, a research paradigm um, of, you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people being a dying, you know, quote, dying race. Um, I think that um, despite that, IATSIS is, you know, a place that we all see as having, having a leadership role. And Rose talked before about um, the different thesaurus work. Um, you know, there are places, there are resources at, at IATSIS that you can go to. One of the things, and it kind of touches on the last question that, you know, if I 
uh, a hope for a role of IAPSIS is thinking about the gaping hole that we have at the moment around resourcing and supporting that idea of living community archives and living libraries. I, Sandra, you talked before about colonization and once you see it, you can't unsee it. Um, if you start to look at the, the fabric of us actually supporting um, local keeping places, you know, whether it's tapping into the data sovereignty kind of, um, you know, the incredible work that's happening around Indigenous data sovereignty, we just don't have any visibility or any light that's being um, shone on the work that communities really want. Um, so I think IATSIS have an incredible role. They've got amazing collections that they also have to do that um, retrospective work with, but you know, I, I hope that we, we start to move from this idea of extraction and start to think about how we support material not leaving an area, you know, and again, back to, you know, thinking about the complexities of recognizing, um, you know, Invasion Day, you know, wouldn't it be amazing if people locally could go and learn that history of, you know, what does 2000 generations of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander history look like locally, instead of us constantly having a colonial view. Fantastic. And we are going to wrap up very shortly, but can one panellist refer to um, this? Should library education include a specific course on processing and handling Indigenous materials? Very briefly, 30 seconds. Who wants to take it? No? Um, that's a tough brief to answer. Yes. To, sure. yes, Kirsten, <laughs> are you going to take that? Oh, yes. It's another gaping hole. Um, our education needs major review and major commitment um, across all the, the GLAM sector, absolutely. Fantastic. And it seems like there's an appetite there for that professional development among the participants of this conference. So what I'm hearing here um, is lots of, um, lots of labour from Indigenous people in and across GLAM sectors lots of really conscious, careful thought that is intellectual, that is spiritual, that is emotional, that is pragmatic and incredibly practical at the operational level as well. Um, I'm also hearing um, a quest to have non-Indigenous people join that journey um, to share the load. Um, we've got 15 seconds left. Nathan, Rose and Kirsten, thank you so much for all of your work in and across these sectors. And thank you for your provocations and your contributions on the panel today. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Sandra. Thanks, Sandra. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much. discussion to have as part of our theme for today, Access or Control. And I think um, Nathan, Rose and Kirsten have given us so much to think about. And I think it's a really important conversation to continue having within our libraries and our GLAM sector. And I just remind delegates that on Thursday and Friday, we will have our perspective sessions, which actually provide an opportunity to delve further into the issues that are raised today. And I think this, this topic, the topics that have been raised by Nathan, Rose and Kirsten and Sandra today will certainly feature very much in those discussions. So again, um, if you didn't have the opportunity, the provocations that were prepared by the panel are available on the ALIA website. And, uh, and I do encourage you to, uh, to listen to those. They really resonate with many of the issues that have been um, talked about, but also coming through on the Twitter feed and on the chat feed. So Nathan, Rose and Kirsten, if you get the time, it'd be fantastic if you could have a look at that Twitter feed later today and, and just respond to some of the questions again. But thank you once again for joining uh, for a really important discussion as part of our conference today. Thank you. <laughs>